Alright, so uh, how's it going everyone? Uh, right. My name is Jorge Casillas. I work with the San Jose Police Department at the Crime Prevention Unit. Uh, so our job at the Police Department is to go out and do education. Uh, that's our thing at the Police Department. So we go to neighborhood associations, we go to neighborhoods, we go to schools, we talk to seniors, we talk to anyone that will hear us, and that's what we do. Uh, but because of that, there's also some things that we at the Police Department, we can't take care of. Uh, so we at the Police Department, as you know, uh, we don't make the rules, we don't make the laws, we just enforce them. Uh, but uh, there's other things that other people at the city can help you with. So if there's any kind of blight, potholes, any kind of street lights, or any issues of those kind, uh, we have the person to speak to you, and this person is here. So if you'd like to introduce yourself, please. Uh, sure, my name is uh, Matt Savage, I'm one of the council assistants for council members. <coughs> and I apologize in advance, I have a three month old, so I can only stay till about eight o'clock. Uh, but I'll be here as long as I can, I'll go home and put her to bed. Um, thank you so much for coming. This is this is the first step to make our community safer. So, like like you know, like you mentioned, so many people don't know their neighbors. And it's becoming a real problem, and it becomes a problem when people don't recognize who they see walking down the street, don't recognize when people are home or not. So, by coming together, working together, you're taking the first step, and and that's really important. Um, a few things our office can help with um, that the police can't necessarily is street lights. Please contact our office. Uh, I left my card here. If a street lights out, we want to get that taken care of. Any kind of illegal dumping, we want to get that taken care of as soon as possible so you don't see more of it. This area in particular, illegal dumping is a real problem, especially from uh, landscaping contractors. Um, you know, we don't want this. This attracts blight, which can attract crime. And also, um, abandoned vehicles, also an issue. Uh, more so in other areas of the district, but here too. And you know, abandoned vehicles, you know, they're not good for property values, they're, they're also not good for attracting crime. So please uh, reach out to our office for that. One of the things we can help with too, they're also good for crime prevention, is something coming up called uh, National Night Out. And that's a big, giant citywide block party, and that's a great way that people come together, have a good time, and also get to meet their neighbors. So that's something you guys want to do, let us know. We can block off the street, we can provide a little bit of funding for food and non-alcoholic beverages and that kind of thing. So just uh, let us know. If there's alcoholic beverages, we're not paying for them. Um, uh, and finally, uh, the other one is a neighborhood association. You know, sometimes, you know, um, organizations like yourself decide they want to be a little bigger, take on other issues, we do a neighborhood association. We see that formed around things like the 27 acres and the 900 homes. So if that's something you're interested in, please contact our office. We don't have a neighborhood association in this area, and we'd love to have one organized. Uh, so please, I'll be here till 8 o'clock. If not, my card's there. And if anyone wants uh, a bag, this is kind of our thank you gift for coming, please uh, let me know. I gave it a few already, but I'd be happy to give out some more. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so any questions for Matt or anything before we get started? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. What day is National Night Out? It's on the first Tuesday of every August, and we're going to talk about that in the presentation. Wow. Perfect. There we go. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, the question I have, when do you report uh, a car when it stays too long? What's, uh, the, what's the time, pr time frame? So 72, 72 hours. hours. 72, okay. And then they tag it, and then they get another 72 hours to move it. Oh, okay, so they tag yeah. it. Okay. So they get tagged, then they have to move. Okay. So it's not tagged, towed, it's tagged, they get a chance to correct and then they get to it. Oh, okay. All right, thank so you. thank you for the question. So let's get started, everyone. So like I said, that is my name. That's the number to our office, and that is also my email address. So if for some reason or another, uh, emails work better for you, and, and that's the way you like to communicate, then that's what we can do. Uh, or you can give us a call. Uh, my responsibility is uh, this whole foothill area, and we're, we'll talk a little bit about that. So what <coughs> is Neighborhood Watch? Neighborhood Watch is not a group for you to go be a vigilante. Neighborhood Watch is not a group for you to go beat people up. Uh, and it's also not a group for you to go break somebody's arm. So if you were here tonight expecting to learn how to break somebody's arm, I apologize, that is not what you're going to be doing here tonight. So, Neighborhood Watch are simple things like this. If there's litter, how to report it, how to clean it up. If there's graffiti, how to report it, how to clean it up. If you see suspicious activity, how to report it, or in the first place, how to prevent the suspicious activity from occurring. Uh, your street is a little dark, uh, but there's some things that you can do to kind of help yourselves out. Because uh, even though you might not be able to get new street lights, you can still get some other things to help you out. So, what is Neighborhood Watch? It's building a supportive group. Daniel mentioned it a bit. 
uh, but just getting to know each other and talking to each other. Uh, somebody's phone. <laughs> getting to know each other, communicating with each other. Uh, oh, how many of you actually know the person sitting next to you? Okay. And we went around earlier, and most of you said you lived on Beckley Drive, so uh, it's important for you to know who and who. Uh, <laughs> no, that is not mine. Mine are in my pocket. But it's all right. We'll, get, we'll keep going. So, what are things that you as a neighborhood can do to build community? Uh, one of the things you all can do is National Night Out. That is the first Tuesday of every August. Uh, you can create your own National Night Out event. And basically what you do is you can have an ice cream social, you can have a small barbecue. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate, but it's basically you and your neighbors getting together and talking. And then we as a police department, we come out and we actually visit your location. Uh, council member uh, also goes out and visits locations. Uh, we have big sanctioned events that they do all over the city of San Jose, so it's not just necessarily the small ones or big ones. They're, they're all over the place, and everyone has a different event. You can do cleanup days, so if you ever need materials for doing a litter cleanup day or you say, you know what, we want to go and we want to clean up the main street on San Felipe, uh, you can reach out to Matt and the anti-litter program. That's a thing that they'll actually give you vests, they'll give you bags, and they'll give you sticks. So you can pick up litter and things of that kind, just to kind of get the presence out there. Uh, you can do neighborhood walks. Uh, we do neighborhood watch, and we also do a thing called dog walker watch. So if you walk your dog up and down the street, you can join other dog walkers and you can patrol your neighborhood. So if you see anything that's out of place or it doesn't make sense, you as dog people can report. So, let's get into what Neighborhood Watch is. We talked a little about how to build community. We talked about Matt and his office at the District 8 and the things they can do for you all. Uh, so let's talk about what Neighborhood Watch is and what we're going to be talking about here tonight. So, Neighborhood Watch is a group of neighbors looking out for each other, and helping each other report crime. So, this is a quick little image. You have one little dog that says he has brown shoes. The other dog says he's between 5 foot 8 and 5 foot 10. And then you have this dog here saying he appears to be male. Now, the reason we have that picture there is because not one of you is going to be able to get all the descriptors of someone who committed a crime or someone who's being suspicious. It's not possible unless you have a background in law enforcement or you have a background uh, in having a, a, a recollective memory. You're not going to remember all the things. So what we always say is always make sure you have multiple people calling in the suspicious activity. Another thing that we're going to talk about in this presentation is the police department is now moving towards a data-driven uh, disbursement of people when they actually have the shift change. Uh, one of the things that used to happen back in the days, they called it the Cadillac service. If you called in about a uh, family disturbance, if you called in about a loud party, any kind of small call, someone would show up. That's kind of changed now. So uh, one of the things that they're doing now is uh, making sure that where there's more calls or where there's more issues, they have more officers there to prevent the issues from occurring in the first place. I don't know if that makes sense to everyone. And if it doesn't, we're going to talk about it in the presentation. So how does a police department work? There's a lot of questions about that. Um, so let's talk about it. So, the police department has a police officer on the streets 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. So if you think there isn't somebody there, there's somebody there. For Christmas, for New Year's, for Thanksgiving, for Easter, any of those holidays that people take the day off, we at the police department don't take those days off. So, here's a question for you all that I want you all to communicate and talk to with the person sitting next to you or the people sitting next to you. If you had to pick a two to three hour window that was the most busiest or the busiest time, two to three hour, in any given day, so be a day swing or midnight shift, what two to three hour window do you think is the busiest for police officers? So go ahead and talk amongst yourselves for a little bit about that. Yeah. 
All right, so everybody talk? All right, so this small group over here, what do you all think? Three. Yeah. Sweet. Sweet. I said, we said uh, midnight. So midnight, and what time frame? Uh, three. Yeah, three, three, two, one. Yeah. Three to one, okay. Yeah. Midnight, you said? Midnight. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys? Nine to midnight. Nine to midnight? Nine to midnight? I say, I say day. Days. You guys? Swing. Swing, okay. We say day. She was born in the day. <laughs> Daytime? 1 a.m. 1 a.m. Oh. You two over here? <laughs> midnight. Midnight. And you guys in the back? Yes. 6 a.m. to 4. 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Okay. So, you got it right. <laughs> so, <laughs> the busiest time is swing is swing between the hours of 3 to 6. 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. are the busiest times for police officers. Do any of you have an idea about why that might be? Commute, mm -hmm. traffic accidents. Yeah, parents are going to pick up kids. <coughs> traffic from picking up kids, kids getting into trouble because they're out of school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you had it before. You said you said it about her. Right. She gets home and she figures out her house has been burglarized. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have all the other issues where you have road rage incidents and all these other things. Uh, so generally, that 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. area is usually the busiest. Now. The reason I give you that information, because if you call during that time and it seems like it's taking a long time for someone to come or it's taking a long time for someone to answer the phone, it's because that's when there's a lot of calls coming in. There's also a shift change going on. So that adds to it as well. This is something that's changing, uh, but now it's going, so it used to be every six months, they would shift from location to location. Now it's switching to every year. So every year there's gonna be a new officer in your beat or in a different area. So it used to be every six months. Uh, before six months, it used to be a year. So it was a year, they switched it to six months, then they switched it back to one year. Why so, would you change that? So the reason for that uh, was because uh, when you know an officer, yes. and you happen to like that person, if you only have them for six months, then people feel a little cheated because they say, oh, that was a good officer, and now he's gone. So now you get to keep him for a whole year. So that's the reason why. Just to build more community. Okay. Uh, it's one of the things that we at the police department are focusing on. Uh, it's called community policing. Uh, making sure that we know the community and the community knows us. Uh, because it does no good for anybody if you don't trust uh, the people enforcing the laws. How so, large of an area does each officer uh, car patrol? You beat me to it. Because I, 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 I don't see them. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that. So. You led me right into the next thing. So, the police department is broken up into four different divisions. Matt can tell you here that our map does not look like his map. He works for the council office, and they have a council office map. So they have different maps. If you talk to somebody from the water district, they have their own map. If you talk to people from planning or all these different things, everyone has a different map. We have the police department, this is our map. So, this big rectangular squared object is where you are at. You are in Foothill. Foothill goes all the way from the border of Milpitas. Generally the 101 is the border and it comes all the way down to the foothills which is a little bit past you uh, up against Morgan Hill. Then you have Western which goes up against Campbell, Saratoga and all of them. Uh, you have Central which goes up to Alviso and then you have Southern which goes up against the hills down here and then also with Morgan Hill. So my responsibility at the police department is this whole section here. So that, that's my whole section. So with that question, what do officers patrol or what are they responsible for? They have four different divisions. If you're in Foothill, you're in Foothill, Western, Southern, and then it's broken down to something like this. It's our beat system. So. Every letter that you see here with the number is one officer. And that's per shift. So here in Paul, you have five officers, maybe six for Paul. And then you move up a little bit north. Then you have Charles, which is kind of that Story King area, uh, that uh, Tully Road where they have the East Ridge Mall. And then you have uh, Mary, which is kind of the central area, which is like uh, Plata Royal, where they have the hospital 
those areas, and then you have Williams, which is the very S area. So there's 84 officers per shift. If someone calls in sick, that's one less person. If there's a major call, the resources have to shift to where there's a major call. So you say sometimes you don't see them. The reason for that might be that there might be a shooting or a stabbing in Charles, and someone has to be at that scene. Well, they block off traffic. The CSOs help with that. Sometimes officers help with that. Uh, the PICS persons come out and they take pictures. They do all these different things. And then what ends up happening is somebody still has to patrol. So while they're there for about five or six hours or however long it is, somebody still has to patrol. So what ends up happening is the officers shift and they cover for each other. So that is why sometimes it seems like you don't see anyone because, yes, they are responding from call to call to call. So uh, that is also, what that means is there's 84 officers for a city of about 1.2, are we at about 1.2, 1.3 million now? Uh, I think unofficially. it's about 1.1. Yeah. yeah, unofficially, right? Like oh. one, one, are we one that point. big? I don't know, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So it's over a million people. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty big, uh, so you can imagine that. Any questions on this? Are, are the beats based on population or the yes. other factors? Yes. So the reason why you over here and Paul have less of a, of a condensation than Mary, because yes, Paul has a, a population that's more spread out. Mm -hmm. And are they, are they Paul 4 or Paul 5? You are in Paul 5. Yeah. So you are kind of down here in this area. You had my windows right there. And this lawyer is here. So, any other questions? So I'm going to show you specifically what Paul looks like. So this is the Paul area. So, uh, Paul is this whole thing. It covers everything from the foothills, down to Mount Pleasant, down to Martin, and the 101 Silver Creek, and ends in San Felipe. So that is the whole area where you are at. Any questions on this? Keep patrolling inside. No? So what are, what are the northern and southern borders? More uh, so your border would be up here, yeah. and then down here. So Morio Hill would be kind of your southern border. Your eastern border would be the hills, and then your western border would kind of be this whole area here. So 101. And then your northern would be Mount Pleasant Road, Martin. <coughs> oh, 101. I thought you said San Felipe. 101? San Felipe, well, 101 goes here, oh. and then San Felipe crosses this way. Oh. So that's for the whole Paul area, not just Paul 5. Yeah. So on the east part is Silver Point Road? Sorry? Yeah. What's the east boundary? The east boundary is up against the foothills. So everything that then turns into county. Is that Yerba Buena Road? Uh, Yerba Buena is still inside. Yeah, oh. yeah so it, it, Yerba Buena Road is around here somewhere. Yeah. This is the whole foothill. So if you keep going further east, that's that's where it's at, and then uh, down here is uh, I think the road is called uh, Madden. Metcalf. Metcalf. There you go. Metcalf. So, yeah. so that's cover, counting. It doesn't that's cover Grant Ranch. Uh, I would have to check on our computer because there's some areas where we do and some areas where we don't. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let's get into how do you look up crime stats? How do you see things that are going on in your area? So. Uh, the San Jose Police Department uh, has different ways of reporting crime to you all as residents in the city of San Jose. So, I gave everybody one of these papers. If you didn't receive one of these, let me know. Uh, basically, everybody got one of these. On the right side, which would be your left side, are all the different phone numbers for the police department. And on the other side are all the different <coughs> phone numbers for the city. <coughs> On here, at the very bottom, you have different websites. This website here. Shows you on this paper here. Crime that has led to a report. So crime mapping and crime reports are two different things. One of them shows you all calls for service. So Crime reports gives you all causal service. Crime mapping here gives you the cause that have led to a report. There's a difference, there's a distinction. So if you see both on the internet, and I'll show you that how it looks, so you can see what we're talking about. So in the last 92, 93 days, 
This is where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. And these are all the things that have led to a report. Mm -hmm. So, what happens here is you have the house, you have the bubbles. Each bubble, if you click on it, gives you a descriptor of what it is. So, if you click on this bubble here, the little mask, it's for a burglary. What it does is it gives you the location of the burglary, approximation, so it gives you a block, it doesn't give you a specific address for privacy. Then, it gives you what day, and it gives you an approximate time of when this occurred. If you were to click on the little fist, that's an aggravated assault. If you click on this icon here, this light green, that's a fraud, so either somebody stole mail, or somebody tried to use someone's uh, information. This here is a weapons violation. The, the ones that have numbers on them are multiple things that have occurred. Now, if you look at this map, your area is here, and this is all residential, and most of the calls are coming from areas where there's businesses. So there's, there's kind of a business here, there's a school here, there's another school here. So, uh, if this does not reflect things that you are seeing in your neighborhood, uh, let me know. I have a question. Huh? When you say the burglary, will it also say what was stolen? No. 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 So no. Not. It'll just say it's a burglary, and it'll say around what time, when it occurred, things like that. Another thing that it'll also give you is here, it'll give you a thing called an incident number. So if for some reason or another you lose your report, a small car they give you, you can go on this website and you can get the number here if you lose it for whatever reason. But so does this... If you, if, you don't, if you don't say that when this picture here, I mean this page, says, you know, the television stolen, the, uh, the number, the, uh, how big it is, serial number, the value of it, if it's on here, how come it's not there? Ah, so... You beat me by 45 minutes into this paper, uh, but we'll get into it. So, this paper here is for you all as residents. It's a thing called Operation ID, and basically what this paper allows you to do is it allows you to create a catalog of the things that you have that you deem are worth value. You can make copies of these, and you can have multiple because I only gave one to each person. And basically, what ends up happening is uh, when someone breaks into somebody's home, and let's say they steal a bicycle. If we pull somebody over with a car full of bicycles, and we know those bicycles are probably stolen, but we cannot connect the bicycle back to you, we can't just give you the bicycle back because you say it's my bicycle. So this here allows us, and it allows you to have some documentation to say, hey, you know what? That red bicycle, it's mine because under the sprocket casing. Oh, it's an inventory sheet. Yep, it's yeah. an inventory sheet. Thank you. So. You never said I didn't ask. <laughs> no, you need to ask. We need to ask because uh, if you guys don't ask questions now, uh, if I came and I spent X amount of hours here and then you say, you know what, I'm still confused, I don't know what's going on, then I, I did a disservice to you all. So please ask. So from there, you can change it. If you don't like maps and you're more of a person who likes mathematics or you like graphs or things of that kind, you can change it into a graph. So what it'll do is it'll give you a day, so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then it gives you a chart in numbers of how much activity is going on in your area. From there, obviously the wall is a little fuzzy, but when you look out on a computer screen, you can actually read all these small labels. So that's a vehicle theft, purple, pink. You have larceny, you have vehicle theft, weapons, assault, burglary is the biggest thing that's going on here. And then you have drugs and fraud. Uh, for some reason or another, Wednesdays are the days that you're having the most activity. Uh, if, if that is true, what do you all, as people who live here, because you live here, I do not live here, what is going on on Wednesdays that would create more activity? Well, trash pickup. So. Trash pickup, okay. <coughs> That's when the grocery store has a sale. Grocery store has sales? <laughs> Could be possible. You all would be the ones that would know because I don't live here. So if, if it's the trash, if it's. Uh, 
someone once someone once said, hey, you know what? Some of these days are the days that kids get out of school a little earlier. I don't know if that's something here. I don't know if Wednesdays are minimum days or restructured days. Thursday. Thursday? Thursday is minimum. Okay. Thursday is minimum day. So you all know because you live here. Uh, is, is there some wild parties that go on on Wednesdays? I don't know. Uh, that You tell me. So you all, sh you all can figure it out. Uh, so, so, is that for our area? That yeah, area? so that is this. Yeah, so that's this whole section here turned into bar graph and a pie chart. Farmer's market, so there's a lot more activity. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah. Farmer's market. Farmer's market. From outside the area coming. And is that on a Wednesday? Yes. Yeah, that's Wednesday and Sunday. Wednesday and Sundays. So there you go. So every area has different issues. Every area has their own specific problems. Uh, that, that is why we always, when we do this presentation, we always tailor it to your neighbor. Question? Does it show what hour? Uh, if you click on this <coughs> bubble, so if you were to go through and click on every bubble, it would give you the date and the time. So where in that map is, is Beckley? Uh, right here. This is Beckley Drive. Oh, okay. Oh, this whole so strip right so This is the, is the house. Oh, oh that's ours. Yeah, yeah. This, this yeah, yeah. Is yeah, so this is the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, like the ones that you see here with the with the number two, that would mean there's two things that were reported out of the same block. Yeah, you can type in your address and it gives you the crimes that are in your yeah. area. Wow. Okay. And the address is right here, so it has a little magnifying glass and you can type it in up there. So my, my wife did this for every apartment we looked at when we decided. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's convenient, and you can use it. You can use it on your smartphone. You can use it on the laptop. However you want. You can use it. It's up to you. So uh, when you go on our website, this is what our website is going to look like. That's also on your paper. Uh, when you click on these little tabs, this is where you're going to find the crime maps, crime stats. And then this is going to be it. So crime mapping was the one I just showed you. Crime reports is the one that collects all calls. Uh, and here's the thing that someone asked me, what does that mean? So with crime reports, if someone calls in suspicious activity, they say, hey, you know what, There's a, there was a loud noise, but I don't know what the loud noise was. That goes into crime reports because we got the call, we collected it, we understood a call was, was made to us, but how do we go to a call if we don't know what the noise was? Small things like that. Uh, those are calls that go into crime reports. Crime mapping would be something that led to a report. So an officer actually put their feet on the ground, they took their paper out or their computer, and they actually wrote a report. Does that make sense to everyone? Because there is a distinction. But everything is collected. So if you go on crime reports, you'll get all the calls, plus you all say crime mapping. So everything is there. It's just a little harder to shuffle through it because you don't know what actually led to a report and what did. So that's why we have both. Any questions? So, yeah. yeah. So, so if you heard a loud noise, would you call three one one? Ah, perfect. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that because there, there is a difference, and you need to know it because it better helps you out, and also you kind of get the best service because you know where you're calling, where you're not calling, well, all those type of things. So the CSOs. How many of you have seen these guys? The girls? Yeah. So. If you haven't seen them or you don't know who they are yet, they're civilians, just like me. Their job is to go out and go to after the fact events. So they call them cold calls. That's what they call them because they're not warm because the suspect isn't there. So uh, if someone broke your window and you came home from work and you realize, hey, somebody broke my window. If you come home from work and you find out your home has been burglarized, it would be the ones to come. Their expertise is in DNA evidence, so collecting fingerprints, collecting blood samples, things of that kind, mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, video film retrieval. So if you have a camera and you say, you know what, I got his face, I got good descriptors of the person, but I don't, they're not here anymore, then the CSOs would go and they would collect the video and then they would triage it to whoever they need to send it to so they can fill out the report and they can hopefully find this individual. So that is their job at the police department. So they will not give you a ticket. They will not pull you over. That is not their job. So if you see them, yeah, that's not their job. Their job is not to pull you over and give you a ticket. So It's good to know. Yeah.
<laughs> yeah, it is actually. A lot of people, they, uh, they, uh, they're, they're hesitant. Yeah. So, now, 911 versus 311. The question was proposed. So, we talked a little bit about what Neighborhood Watch is. Talked a little bit about how you can look up crime stats so you can be informed of what's going on in your area and what's not going on in your area. So now we're going to talk a little bit about how to call us for things that are going on. So, 911 is a threat to life or property or fire and crime in progress. So something is going on at the moment. So, if someone threatened you with a knife, if someone pulled a gun on you, if someone did any of those things, it's a threat, it's a 911 call. Call us. If you say, you know what, someone, someone uh, stole my car and they took off, it's not in progress anymore because they already stole my car, you know what, still call 911. Because they're, they have to find the car. It's still in progress because the car is still driving away. They need to find out who this person is, what direction they took off, and things of that kind. So we're going to talk about that. So, how many of you still have a landline only? You don't have a cell phone. Anybody here just have a landline? So everyone has a cell phone here? Yeah. Yeah? All right. So, when you dial 911 from a landline, we know where you are. There's a wire that comes out of the phone, or uh, it's through an internet provider. We know your location. When you call us from a cell phone, because cell phones work off of cell phone towers, antennas, we do not know where you are at. So, uh, those of you that have called 911 through a landline, the, the first question you'll probably get is, what's your emergency? If you call from a cell phone, the first question you'll probably get is, what's your location? Yeah. And then you say, well, it doesn't matter what my location is, there's an issue going on, I need you to get here right now. And they say, but we need your location. And then you say, why do you keep asking for my location? The reason for that is because they don't know where you're at. This gets compounded more if you're near a freeway. So if you're near a freeway, what will end up happening is actually the call gets redirected either to the Highway Patrol or to the Vallejo Police Department. It gets, gets, gets triaged because they work off of antennas. So uh, what we always tell everyone is if you have a cell phone only, you don't have a landline. Make sure you have this San Jose 911 cell phone number in your cell phone. It is on this paper. It is at the top of the list. You have 911 and then you have 408-277-8911. If you have a cell phone only, I would recommend that you put this on your phone. I would put it at the top of your contact list. However your contact list work, that is up to you. However you work your phone. Uh, and also remember that this is only for the city of San Jose. So if you're in Mopitas, if you're in Morgan Hill, if you're in Gilroy, uh, if you're all the way down in Monterey, this is not the phone number for their police department, this is for our police department. So when you call this, you'll hear San Jose Police Department, you, you won't hear where you're at. Oh, so, so if you were, um, if, uh, you were on the freeway in San Jose, you wouldn't call this, or would you? Uh, no, because if you're on a freeway, that's uh, highway patrol. So just mm -hmm. dial 911. Oh. And they'll direct you. I have a question. Mm -hmm. We have cameras, right? Okay. And I have it if I happen to check out my phone, I see mm -hmm. someone that I don't know inside my house. But I'm not here, I'm in San Luis Obispo. Uh -huh. How do I call? So, oh my you're God. watching it happen or it happened already? No, I'm watching it happening. So, I would call this cell phone 911. It will go through my cell, I don't have to dial. No, because if you already <coughs> have the 408 area code on the phone when you call, mm -hmm. it should pick up the 408 and then dial here. And then you can let us know, hey, this is what's going on, this is my address, someone's in my house right now, and I'm watching it on my camera. But you have to dial one first, and don't forget that. Because if you just dial 408, it doesn't go and go back. You have to dial 1408 and then the number. There you go. It's a given. That number 277 one, one, yeah. That's directly to us at the police department. Yeah, because when you give out these numbers, you know, many people don't know that in these cases, you need to dial a 1, period. Otherwise, you'll go through. Yeah. So, the 1, everyone, fix it on that presentation. 
Any other questions about this 911? <coughs> so 311. What is 311? 311 is a non threat to life or after the fact. So uh, you come home from work, you realize your home has been broken into. 311. That's after the fact. You wake up in the morning, you find that your window to your vehicle is broken. That's a 311. Uh, it's, it's non emergency, it's after the fact. So nobody's there, the threat is gone. And you call us 311. Now, I will be honest with you, for 311, there is a wait. Now, you're going to hear from people, they're going to say, Oh, I've been waiting for 10, 15 minutes. That is true, there is a wait. Uh, the reason for that is because 911 dispatchers are different than 311 dispatchers. They're two different people. So, uh, they, they need as many 911 dispatchers as they can get. So, this one for the same whole the city only, not in Peter? No. No. Yeah. Just for the city of San Jose. So, so say like you see someone that looks suspicious, you know, and you, you have pretty good suspicion that this guy's a bad character. Would you call 911 in that particular case? So <coughs> are they doing anything other than just being suspicious? Well, there could be something about this guy that you think is a bad character. It's not just that he looks bad, but yeah. he's doing something like he's shifty, he's looking, maybe checking some doors. You know, doors of cars, maybe he... Uh, so yeah. that, so that, that is key right there. So did everybody hear that? Yeah. He's not just being shifty, he's trying to jangle doors open, or he's looking into cars, things of that kind. Yeah. That could be a potential crime in progress. Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things that, if you don't call it in, or you don't let us know, and you, you see him trying to open doors, he's going to find an open door. Because generally, uh, I hate to say this, but there's a lot of people that leave their doors open. <coughs> uh, so yeah, I would call that 911. Uh, right after the same week that we installed the cameras mm -hmm. before Christmas, there were two guys walking, 10-11 mm -hmm. in the evening, okay. and one of them came to our car and just gently tried to open it. Mm. Now, is that a 311 or 911? Because we hear a broad description of the number one, there were two guys, okay. and then I had the camera video showing it. Now, those people are 10, 11, and they're after, they are no good. Now, so that should be reported, so in case patrols are going around, they can stop them. Did you see it as it was happening, or after it happened? After. Uh, not too long, about half an hour, let's say. Okay. 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Because it, it tells us on the phone, maybe someone... Yeah, yeah. yeah if, it, if it's still like a 5 or 10 minute window, I, I would call 911, or you know what, if you don't want to make a judgment call, just call 911. And then the dispatcher will they'll either send you through one or they'll answer the call right then. The and reason there. why I ask is because if they try to do it to our car, yeah. they could keep going and, and looking for another. Well, and they're already on your private property, it sounds like. So they've already started, you know, breaking. Yeah, but, but what I'm areas. saying, so the police department be aware yeah. that there's a, yeah. two guys at that hour. And they may be patrolling this area, and if they look at it, they yeah. can stop them. To yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I would, yeah. I would call it in. And then, uh, you know, if you have evidence or whatever it might be, then someone could come pick up the video, mm -hmm. and hopefully, you know, if, if they did do something, then they can link them to other crimes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? No? So let, let's get into the suspicious activity <coughs> uh, that was proposed. Uh, first things first. Always respond to activity at the front door. This is how this works. If someone knocks at your door, do you have to open the door? No. If someone knocks at your door and you see them through the people, should you talk through the door? Yes. 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 I heard some hesitation. Yes, talk through the door. Because the last thing you want to do is be inside your house, someone knocks at your front door, you don't say anything, they assume nobody's home, and then they kick in your door. That's the last thing you want. Because then it gets into a confrontation issue, and then you don't know if that person has a weapon, you don't know if that person is under the influence. Whenever there's a confrontation, it could always go south. So. If someone knocks at your door, talk through the door. Say, what do you want? I wasn't expecting anyone. 
If they say, oh, I'm with PG&E, and you say, well, I didn't call PG&E. Oh, well, we're here doing solar audits. You say, no, it's okay. When will you be home again so I can come again? Don't tell them when you're going to be home. You're shaking your head. I appreciate that. Don't tell them when you're going to be home. Because they're asking you that question because then they figure the other times they're probably not going to be home. So then they can come and break into their house. So if people are asking you what time you're going to be home, don't give them that information. If it is that they really are from PG&E, you can call PG&E and you can ask. Or you can ask for the ID. The same. Well, they, they have phony IDs as well. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. The same week of the two guys, there was a gentleman that came and tried to go to the side. Yeah. But this, the gate is locked. Mm. So they came to the door, but he didn't leave any card or anything. Yeah. So he said PG&E. Yeah. So we went to PG&E offices, and they said, no, there's no record of a service to your place. But it may be from another city that they bring them over here to do something. Yeah. About two weeks later, my wife and I were walking the dog, and we saw the guy. So I went. Oh, and we also made a report to the police. Good. But Thank I you. went to and talked to him. Yeah. And my son got upset because I went and talked to him. No, <laughs> Lisa, my daughter, because I went and talked to him. But I wanted to find out. Yeah. 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 So my, my point is, I did follow up. Yeah. Because he was right. He was he worked for PG&E. He showed me his ID. And he was checking for corrosion of the, the gas pipes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And that's a mandate from the federal government. Mm -hmm. But my point is, don't be complacent. Yep. Follow up. Do some of that. No. So I understand. Yep. And you always have that right. So you always have the right to then call them and say, hey, what's going on? <coughs> this person came to my door. This is who they said they are or said they are. What's, what's going on here? Things like that. Uh, Always, if something doesn't feel right, like this gentleman said over here, if something doesn't feel right, it, it, it doesn't just, it doesn't just, it doesn't sit well with you, do something about it. Mm -hmm. Don't just stand there and say, you know what, man, that guy's totally going to break into that car, but I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to get, I don't want to get in any kind of problems. Mm -hmm. By you calling, you can call us anonymously. You don't have to give us your name, you don't have to give us your phone number. You don't even have to give us your address. As long as you tell us what's going on, that's what happens. Now, if you witness a serious crime, you say you saw someone get murdered or whatever it might be, we might call you because we need to get information from you. We need to get a statement. You can say, you know what, I want to meet you somewhere that is in my house. Or please don't knock on my house. Call me on my cell phone. We can have a conversation that way. There's different ways that we can communicate with you. We don't necessarily have to talk to you or knock on your door so the whole neighborhood can see you. Then we're talking to you. There's different ways. So but always if, report but, it. But if you call the police department and the landline, don't they have call ID? Yes, we do, but we don't have to necessarily call you back. But you know the number. Technically, we always know the number. Okay. Yes, technically. It's not yes. Yeah, but we're not going to call you if you tell us not to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. We can't just call you because we want to. I won't answer. <laughs> there you go. Straight to voicemail. <laughs> So install peoples. I saw that most. I saw that you know the house have some. So uh, I know that uh, Mr. Reyes said the house was built in the 70s. Uh, I don't know if all the houses were built here in the 70s or not. Uh, so, so just okay. So if the peoples are a little you know fuzzy or a little older or whatever it might be, replace them. Get them up to date. Whatever it might be. Now I'm going to show you all a video uh, of suspicious activity and why you should kind of report it. Uh, so. There's going to be a, a, a sequence at the bottom that has a time. Watch the time. And there's also going to be a vehicle and an individual. There. So there's a, there's a neighbor of mine that we have had confrontations with. Mm. He claimed that he was the first one in the street. And ah. I tell him that I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You show him the deed of the house. I used to live at 3077 Beckley Drive. I used to be your neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> so. I was the first one. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't uh, believe it. <laughs> like I said, make sure you always report any kind of crime or anything like that. Uh, so, here's the time at the bottom. We're at about 33.30. You see a red car? You're going to see a young person right there. Most people that break into homes are going to be young males. 
Uh, and we're getting into the, kind of the ages and all that type of stuff. What you're going to have here is you're going to have a homeowner. This guy here. He sees something, sees something. He's like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. It's daytime. Shouldn't he be in school? Why is that kid walking down my street? Like two people walking up and down the street. Gets into the car. <coughs> He's going to leave. And he stops again. Now we're at 41. He's going to take off. <laughs> Doesn't go to the garage. Yeah. Now at the top of the screen, you're going to see this young man again. Now we're at 43. Then across the street. How come we cross the garage? No, he closed the garage. He closed oh, he did? The, yeah, he did. He's going to come on. This is the same property, different angle <coughs> of where you're seeing it. Bless you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're at 43, mind you. There's some cars on the street, so there, there might be some people in the neighborhood. He's going to come to the front door. And what do you all think he's going to do when he comes up to the front door? Take hey, what's there. He knocks. Did anybody answer the door? No, there's a red car again. We're at 44, 45 now. He's going to take off. Is this okay? He left the house. I saw him leave. There's nobody else in the house. This is, yeah, this is a real thing. He's going to take off, and then he's going to come back. But he's not going to come back by himself. I'm sure you all can figure. So they come back. We're at 51 now. Two people come out. Now, we started at around 40. Now we're at 51. So it's been about 11 minutes. Nobody's called, nobody said, hey, this is kind of suspicious, some young guys. And then this is one of the, one of the main ways that people make entry to a house, the open side gate. Thank you for locking your side gate. Most people don't lock their side gate. So they make entry, and then we can all figure out what happens from there. They go into the house. They go in through the sliding. Not only the, it's a gate, but also I install an iron a door on the, on the, the right side. On the side? Since when she got broke into it, because yeah. that's how they got into her house. That's yeah. So I put a, also an iron. They Good. broke it actually. I don't know. It's, it's a strong it. door. Oh. Yeah. They kicked it in or? Kicked it. Like, what? okay. So the reason I show you all that video is to drive home the fact and to let you all remember that you need a call. If you see something, if something doesn't feel right, you say, oh, that guy's being kind of sketchy or. You know what? Hey, it's Tuesday at 10 a.m. in the morning. Why are these young kids walking around my neighborhood? Shouldn't they be in school? What's going on? Call it in. Let us know. Most people that break into homes are going to be young males between the ages of 14 to 25 at the least. That's usually who's going to do these type of things. When you call us. Yeah. Just case people want more. Thank yeah. you so much. No worries. Thank you, Matt, for coming. Take care of your, Thank you, Matt. Take care of your baby, okay? Sit up. My, my baby's excuse me. <laughs> so when you call 911, this is what it's going to kind of look like for the dispatcher. They're going to have multiple screens in the front. As soon as the call comes in, they're already sending somebody out. So don't be frustrated or don't say, you know, quit asking me all these questions. What are you talking about? They're already figuring out or they're already sending somebody to go to your call. Now, how do you describe somebody? That is something that we always talk about in every presentation because you mentioned it. Well, how do I call them and let them know, hey, you know, if this person is looking a little funky, you know, they're jangling doors, they're peeping into people's windows, they're trying to see if windows can open, they're trying to go maybe look in the side gates. This is how you would describe somebody. Now, this is for you all to take home. So the first side of it has the important phone numbers. On the back side of it, it has a suspect description. It also has a vehicle description. 
Yeah. Yeah, about two weeks ago or so. I don't know if any of you know Rose Ataide. She she has a daycare. Oh, yeah. Her name is. Okay. We were driving and we and Rosa saw a lady parked close to that house and was suspicious. So she says, go around, so I did. So you guys can take the extra time. And then the next time that I went around, I took a picture of the license plate. Mm -hmm. and then she called Rose to let her know that there had been a lady in a, in a suburban in that area. If it was a family or anybody like that. She wasn't home, she was away. Okay. So I think what I'm saying is that we have to look after each other. Yeah. If you see something suspicious, yeah. don't throw it on the side. Yep. Take the extra step to do something about it. Yeah. And this is how, how you how you call it in or you let people know. Uh, now, if I say, you know what, uh, the guy was wearing a gray sweater with a shirt that looks like it has a collar on it. Do I know if this young sir here has another shirt underneath his collared shirt. No, I do I know by looking at him. Now, what's to say that after he commits his crime, he's not going to take his sweater off and he's not going to take his pole off? If he's wearing, are you wearing trousers? Or wearing, yes, he's yes. wearing trousers. So slacks, nice slacks. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's to say he's not wearing shorts underneath? <laughs> His pants. It's too cold. <laughs> for you, for a young 14 year old man, it's perfect. So, the reason we talk about that is because the way to help best describe people are by things that they can't take off. Okay. Things that are always going to be there. So, if they have a tattoo on their neck, if they have a, a special type of facial piercing, if they have hair that's a particular color that they can't just take off because it's real hair, things of that kind. If they have a particular way of walking, if they have a limp, if you notice, they say, you know what, one of his arms is shorter than the other one. There's not very many people that have one arm shorter than the other one. A leg? A leg that's shorter than the other one. Any kind of thing like that. Uh, also, what direction they're going in. Now, this might be hard for a lot of people, but basically you just need to remember if it's towards the hills, it's east. If it's going anywhere other than the hills, it's west. And then north would be going towards Los Pitas. So just a general idea about kind of what direction they're going in. For vehicles, if you see a car and you say uh, it's a white Honda, how many white Hondas do you think people have in Paul? probably a lot of people with white Hondas. So, if you see a white Honda, is it missing a hubcap on the passenger side? Does it have a particular bumper sticker that says, uh, uh, run by veggie oil? Cracked window. Cracked window. Uh, any kind of window tints, any kind of sticker, anything that makes it stand out that isn't just a white Honda. Because if you say white Honda or white Toyota, most people have Toyotas and most people have Hondas. Now, are they stealing the, the license plates and put them on top of stolen cars or something like that? Well, what we've been seeing a lot lately is actually paper plates. Oh. So they were using a lot of paper plates. Now, do you all know there's a new law now where they can't have paper plates? So that's good for us. Uh, it might make more work for the dealers, but now people have to have, if it's a paper plate, it has to have a number on it. So it's a number that's generated through the DMV. No longer can you have uh, gyms, auto sales, or whatever. Maybe I don't know if there's a gym, auto sales, or not. I'm just saying that. I don't know if there is. Uh, but, you know, that would be the thing. So, uh, those type of things. Uh, if they have bumpers that are a different color, if they have a door that's red but the car is gray, things of that kind. If they have a particularly loud exhaust, that you say, you know what, I can tell that exhaust, you know, somebody would be able to tell that. Things like that. So, anatomy of a residential burglary. You hit it earlier on the head. Most home burglaries do happen between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, I'm assuming that's when it happened because you said it's when you came home from work. Yeah, it's 1 o'clock. So that's generally when they occur. Uh, they generally occur uh, by young males, like I said, from 14 to 25. 
They're usually going to make entry through a side gate, through an open window, anything that's the path of least resistance. Uh, these people want to get in and out. They don't want to struggle, they don't want to fight with you, they don't want to leave DNA, they don't want to leave anything behind. They just want to get in and out as quick as possible. What are they taking? The usual stuff. Guns, money, jewelry, things they can sell really quick. We're also seeing that they're taking prescription medications. Yeah, so if you are prescribed painkillers, if you're prescribed Xanax for anxiety, any kind of antidepressant medications uh, in your home was broken into, and it looks like nothing's been moved, go and look at your medicine cabinet, because they maybe already went there. And that's what they might have taken. Uh, so just be mindful that they're taking that type of thing. Guns is also another thing they take. So if you have a firearm in the house, uh, please be responsible, lock it up, do whatever you need to do uh, to make sure that nobody can use it to commit any kind of crimes. So, uh, most burglaries, like I said, want to get in and out. 60 seconds is the most they generally want to spend. Uh, what they'll do is actually case your neighborhood for a week or two before they actually break into the homes. So if you start seeing weird people coming around that you've never seen that person before, two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is before, something happens or you know you say something happened and then you're like, I remember there were some weird guys riding around on bicycles. It's casing. They're looking. Uh, it's like when people go window shopping. You go to the store, you look at something and you say, I like that, but I'm not going to buy it right now. I'm going to save up or do whatever it is and then I'm going to come and get it later. It's the same concept. They're just not spending money. They're taking it from you. Things you can do, uh, like I said, your street is a little darker. So if you can leave uh, a radio on so it sounds like somebody's home, uh, lights on, we're going to talk about that a little bit. They also have these cool little mechanisms that it sounds like a dog if someone walks in front of it. So uh, let's say you put it behind the front door. If someone walks through in front of the front door, it'll bark like a dog so it'll sound like somebody's there. You laugh, but yes, it does sound like a German Shepherd, not a Chihuahua. Uh, if you have a chihuahua, that is not going to stop anybody from breaking into your house. <laughs> a chihuahua is not going to do it. Uh, Where do you buy that? Uh, they sell them online. Uh, they also sell them at your local home improvement stores. Uh, there aren't very many local home improvement stores, so you can kind of... We're not allowed to say which store. Uh, uh, signs that say dog on premises or alarm system in use. Uh, just be mindful of that. Don't put a sign that says rabid or dangerous dog on premises because uh, you know you don't want to give the assumption that your dog is dangerous mm -hmm. things like that you know if there's a dog on premises they know it might get bit because it came into your house uh, you know if there's an alarm letting them know hey there's alarms here there's cameras here if you're being videotaped someone's going to see you i heard something that we shouldn't put a sign that said what kind what system we have like, uh, oh, if you have like ADT or you have yeah, brain, don't or say that. Yeah. Uh, well, because they know how to uh, override it. Yeah, or when you, they come in, they know how to, to decide. Yeah, so I'll leave that up to you. What we're seeing right now is a, uh, a lot of the times what they'll do is they'll cover their face. So be it whatever system it might be, they cover their face. Uh, a lot of times, too, people will have cameras at the corners. But then all they do is get the top of their head, so it doesn't really help us out. But that's no hoodie they're wearing, but it doesn't really help us out. Yeah, they block, uh, they block. Yeah, bolt lock. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about this thing called landscaping. Now, this is a service that's offered for you all as residents on the east side of San Jose. It's called TABS, uh, Truancy Abatement Suppression. So, that number is on this piece of paper. On that paper, it's here. It's tabs right next to 24-hour anonymous line. That is, uh, if you see young people that should be in school, that aren't in school, Monday through Friday, school hour times, up until about 12, uh, you call them, and if they're available, which they might be, they might not be because they might be picking somebody else up, they'll go and they'll pick up the young person, and they'll actually keep them at a center until the parents come and pick them up. So they can't just pick them up and then they go on their way. No, they pick them up, they keep them there until somebody shows up that's an adult, and picks them up and takes them home. So another service that you all have here uh, in San Jose. So uh, we're going to talk about the three L's, lighting, locks, and landscaping. So we talked a little bit about uh, how to report crime. 
what it kind of looks like, how to deter it. Now we're going to get into the meats and potatoes of how to prevent it from actually happening to you. So, lights, a lot of people say motion light sensors, we want them. What I will say to you all is it's okay to have those, but it's also a thing where you want to have a light on all the time. Now, how many of you have heard of LEDs? Yes, no, maybe so. If you've heard of LEDs, basically LEDs are a light bulb that basically wastes almost no electricity. They are really expensive up front, that is true, but they last for 10, 15 years, sometimes even longer. The motion lights are good because they turn on when someone's around. The problem with that is generally they're already too close to your house and you want to prevent them from ever coming close to you. I don't know if you all have heard of a thing called the onion. We call it the onion of protection. So you want to have multiple layers that people have to peel back so they can get to your home. It's kind of like the small Russian dolls where you take the top off and then you have another doll and you take the top off and you have another doll. So you want to have these multiple layers of protection and your house is going to be at the center. And as many of these layers as you can add, the more likely that your the more the likelihood that your house will be broken into is a lot less. So you want to have lights, you want to have timers. This is really important when we talk about Christmas lights, we'll also talk about it now. If you go to bed every night at 9.30 and you turn off your lights every night at 9.30, someone is probably going to notice that at 9.30 your lights go off every single day. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Christmas lights. You turn them off at 9.45, 9.30 every day, someone's going to notice. So, use a timer. You'll say, you know, I'm not going to stay up. I'm going to go to sleep because I have to go to work the next day. That's fine. Use a timer. Stagger the lights. Maybe one day you'll just leave it on the whole night just to see what goes on. Maybe uh, you'll have a mechanism that makes it look like a TV is on and it gives a reflection of a TV so you can see. They can see light. If, you know, you're going to do things like that, just remember, you know, about consumption, energy, and all that, because it could get pricey if you, if you let it go out of hand really quick. So that's why we recommend the LEDs, because the LEDs help with that. Now, I'm going to show you all some houses. I want you all to tell me what are the bad things about the houses I'm going to show you. So first of all, you're going to talk about the bad things, and then secondly, we're going to talk about the good things. So, what's the bad thing about this house? Talk amongst yourselves or say it out loud, make sure you feel more comfortable. Side, okay, it's dark. Oh. Yeah, the lights are on outside but not inside. Okay. The tree. Did you say the tree? You are the only person in the last year and a half that has actually said the tree. No one ever mentions the tree. Thank you. You are a good detail person. I'm becoming paranoid. Yes, the tree is in front of the door. And when the foliage grows out, you can't see the front door anymore. See, that's the trick. It's winter, so you don't see the foliage. Exactly. That's why we throw it in there. That's what I'm saying. Hey, she's the first person that gets it. That's what I'm saying. Congratulations. Okay, so what are some good things about this house? Lots of light. Shrubs are low. Shrubs are low? Yeah. Anything else? Some, someone once said, it's a nice big house, so they make good money. <laughs> Somebody told me one time. And I thought that was pretty funny. Okay, now the next one. What's the bad about this house? So it has hours. No curtains in the front. No curtains, the front doors, made out of glass. The windows. Yeah, those doors are very weak. Okay, the doors could potentially be broken because they connect in the middle. 
-hmm. Anything else that's kind of weird or doesn't make maybe a lot of sense? Anybody notice on the side of the house it's completely dark? Yeah. No garage. No garage potentially? Anything else? So what are the good things about this house? Yeah. Landscaping is low. Landscaping is low? Lighting in and out. Lighting inside and outside? So there's a distinction between private and public. And that was one of the things that on this house is it's kind of hard to tell, right? You know that there's a difference between private property and public, but it's not as grand as here. Anything else? Okay. So, yes, some people like for their things to be showcased. Mm -hmm. I understand it makes the house look nicer, it gives it more, uh, I guess you could say, it gives it a better aesthetic, whatever it might be. Uh, but just be mindful uh, that people can see what's going on inside. So just be mindful of that. They can see the things you have, things you don't have. So just be mindful of that. If you do like the, this look, you can always put a sheer curtain. Uh, just to kind of give a little bit of privacy, small things like that. Now, that was a little bit of lighting. We're going to talk a little bit about locks. So, um, your houses were built, you all said, in the 70s and 80s, things like that. So I think those house, these houses were built with better quality than some of the newer homes. Some of the newer homes are just paced together really quick. Um, but I would still ask you all to look at the frames of your doors, the front door especially, and look at the screws. Are the screws three quarter inch long screws or are they two and a half to three inch long screws? The reason for that is because the small screws go in to the frame, but they don't go to the stud, the reinforcement of the frame. When most doors get kicked in, most people think it's gonna be the door that fails but that, it's actually the opposite. It's the frame portion that usually fails and the door stays intact. The reason for that is because the frame isn't being reinforced. So, but, but that's a single door. Ours is a double door. Yeah. So the double doors, uh, and now this, this might, like you said paranoid. So uh, <laughs> you can put locks that connect the doors to the actual top plate and then you can put the three inch long screws. Uh, if you all remember back in the days, in medieval times, they actually used to put a block that would connect both doors. So it has a holder, and then they put a, a block mechanism to prevent the doors from opening this way. You can do that. Uh, those are all the different things you can do to, to do, especially because the double doors, yeah, they're a lot more, I guess they're a lot more susceptible to being kicked in. Yeah. So those are small things you can do. Um, well, like ours, it's got two. Uh, okay. On both goes, sides or just one side? The, the, the one that's one stationary, yes. okay. it's got one on top and one on the bottom. Okay, and the other side doesn't? And the other one, the one that swings open all the time, yeah. only the dead ball. Okay, so yeah, those would be things you can do. Um, you can try the, the, the actual bar that connects both doors, that mm -hmm. way it can be open. Of course, that makes it a little difficult when you're not home. Uh, but those are small things you can do. Now, for those of you that have a single door, I think they might sell these for double doors. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that. There's a websites for these. These door frame reinforcers, basically what they do is they bolt up to the frame, and they actually make it so you have different points of connection. So it's not just the one middle part that connects the door. You have multiple parts. And they all come with the three inch long screws, that way they all go into the stud, that way the door is reinforced. Uh, with one of these generally, uh, when someone kicks in a door, it's about two to three kicks to kick in a door. Uh, with one of these, it's usually about seven or six kicks. So by that time, hopefully somebody will have heard it, and somebody will call it in, because you're out here. So uh, you can try complex keys. Uh, these keys are are made specifically for you, for your application. They have dimples, they have crevices, they have all these things that only that key has, and nobody else has. These are kind of expensive, uh, but that is another thing you can do. You can also put these uh, covers, these latch covers, 
So if you're worried that someone's going to use a crowbar or do whatever it is to open the door, you can put one of these covers. So especially if you have a shed in the back, if you have something where it's not the front door, uh, you have a side gate, whatever it might be, that's something you can use. So uh, locks. Uh, a lot of people, they like to leave windows open uh, so they can get air in through the house so there isn't any kind of mold or anything like that. Uh, if you are going to do that, use a wood dowel to prevent the window from opening further. The window does not need to be open more than an inch, inch and a half. That's enough for the air to come in. You do not have to leave it open seven to eight inches. Or you don't leave it open enough that a small person can stick their arm in and then take it out. Like I said, most of these people that are committing these home burglaries are going to be young people. Generally teenagers. That's who's going to be doing these things. Uh, you can put these locks. So I see you have a sliding door mechanism. Um, these things prevent the actual sliding door, the actual door from lifting out of the frames. Out of the trucks. Prevents it from lifting out of the trucks. Because you can actually take the, the, the actual glass off of the track. If you've ever tried to clean or any kind of thing like that, that's how you can do it. So they sell these at your local home improvement store. Uh, and you can put them in place. You can screw them in. You can also, if you, if you feel that you say, you know what, I don't want to spend the X amount of dollars, get a screw, screw it in. But they break into the windows now. They've broken the window? They, they are breaking with the windows now in the back. Okay. There's nothing to Well, you can put a sticker on it. I don't know if you all have seen those. Mm -hmm. uh, they're decorative stickers that you can put on the glass. Yeah. I don't know if you all have seen them. They sell them at, like, at your local home improvement store. <laughs> uh, but basically what they do is they sell them in a big roll mm -hmm. and they're decorative stickers so they have floral prints or whatever it might be and you stick it on the window so then what ends up happening is if someone tries to break your glass the film will actually hold it in place so they, they, yeah they, they sell them uh, well there's only two home improvement stores so there's loads of them it has to be a big Cover all the window, yeah, so they sell them in whatever, so they sell them in rolls and then you can buy as many rolls as you need. What do they sell? Uh, uh, like Home Depot rolls. I have those at my house. Oh. On the back door, I have the glass. Are there, are there many burglaries happening in the evening when people are home sleeping? So, in general or recently? In general. In general, it's exceptionally rare. It's exceptionally rare. Uh, because they, these individuals that commit these crimes, they generally want to get in and out. Mm -hmm. And they know that if they do it at night, there's probably going to be somebody sleeping in the house. Yeah. So they rarely, rarely want to come in at night time. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, these guys are professionals, and they know what they're doing, and they say, you know what, I've scoped the house out, I've done my homework, I've done whatever it is, I know that no one's going to be home, and I know that the rest of the neighbors aren't going to say anything. I'm going to go in. But generally, no, you're not going to see that anything. No, but leaving the, the, the rice door open when you're coming home to unload the groceries and all that. So is the car inside the garage or on the outside? Uh, either. So now, the other day, the lady on the corner, Yeah. she forgot. Oh. She left the, the back. Yeah, so. I went and knocked on the door and said, the door is open. So about a, yeah, about a year ago, that was, that was a problem that was going on. Mm -hmm. People were leaving the garage door open. Please close your garage door. Um, yeah, because you're just you're just asking for it. I mean, I hate to say that, but you're basically asking for it because you're leaving everything open for them to just basically walk up, take it, and then walk away. Mm -hmm. So, are you saying to only leave the window open an inch and a half at night, even? Well, some people like to do this in their showers or in their, yeah. in their rooms, in their bathrooms or whatever for air. So if you're going to do it, just leave it just an inch and a half, inch at the most. It doesn't need to be open more than that. And the dowel would go on the other side of the track to prevent the window from opening further. Mm -hmm. So uh, I always have this slide here uh, because every, everyone's situation is different. In my family, uh, my mother has arthritis. So there's certain things that she can't open or certain things that she can't kick open because it makes it hard for her to grab it or kick it or whatever it might be. So if you are going to put some things, make sure that everyone in your house can actually use them. 
The last thing you want is if there's a fire or any kind of emergency that people can't get out because you put something there. So just be mindful of those type of things. Uh, landscaping. I drove by your neighborhood. Um, things seem pretty reasonable. Um, there aren't too many overgrown bushes. There aren't too many things that are out of whack. Uh, but we're still going to talk about it because it kind of gives you information for the future. So, uh, bushes. This is not what you want to do with your bushes. You don't want to give somebody a place to hide. Huh? When you leave, go and make it right on the, on the street. <laughs> and the next <laughs> house, <laughs> you can barely walk to the sidewalk now. Oh, yeah. they have a jungle? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it only leaves you this much of the, yeah. of the <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just be mindful of that. Uh, bushes, you generally don't want them higher than three feet. Tree lines, you generally don't want them to start at lower than six feet. So, if there's a tree and it has a foliage line, six feet and above, bushes, three feet or lower. Now, some people say, well, well does that mean that I can leave the bush all the way to the ground? Generally, what we always say is you always want to leave at least six to eight inches visible so you can see somebody's feet or if somebody's laying there because uh, people will use it as a hiding place. If they committed a crime, they'll hide behind a bush. So just be mindful of that. Now, some people say, well, you know what? I have, I have vegetation, but what kind of vegetation can I use to keep people away? So uh, this picture we have here, if you are worried that your windows, because they're facing the street, are going to get broken into, you can always put rose bushes, you can always put holly, you can put things like that. We call it hostile vegetation, uh, but you can call it thorny stuff. Rose, rose bushes are pre preferred. Yeah. There you go. So you can do whichever one you feel more comfortable with. Basically what ends up happening here is this is a psychological deterrent. When they see that, they say, you know what, it's not going to be a good deal for me. I'm probably going to get pricked. Someone's probably going to hear me fumbling through the bush. My clothes are going to get ripped. I'm not going to do it. We're going to go to the next house. <laughs> numbers. Uh, I, I didn't really see a lot of numbers on the front of everyone's homes. I don't know if that's done on purpose by you all. Um, I saw it on the, on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. yeah. but I didn't really see it on the homes. Oh, yeah. So, they are. They are? Okay, because I didn't really see many. So They are also on the mailbox. What was that? On the, on the mailbox. mailbox. On the mailbox, okay. So what we always tell everyone is you want to have numbers, big numbers yes. on the front of your house. Because mm -hmm. if there's an emergency, somebody can show up. Somebody can be there. Mm -hmm. If you have uh, the numbers behind rose bushes, no. it doesn't really help out anybody. So make sure that it's clear. You can see it. If you're going to put a light on it, shine a light on it. Do whatever it is so we can see it. Uh, pebbles are sort of things that people can do to create noise. Now, I say pebbles. I don't say river rocks. I don't say boulders. I don't say granite rock. Small little pebbles. Put a river rock, someone's going to throw it through your window. So just be mindful of that. The reason for this here is if you, you can hear footsteps. Someone's walking by your house, someone's walking around your neighborhood. If you say, you know what, I'm on the second story, and I put these small little pebbles on the front of my yard, I heard someone crunching, crunching, crunching. That means someone's probably on my yard. Things like that. So just be mindful of that. It's really quiet out here. Um, I don't know if it's always this quiet, yeah. but generally when I come out to Evergreen and Paul, it's usually pretty quiet. Yeah, my, my wife heard my young son when he was <laughs> celebrating 18 years old. And he, says, he, he came through the side and said, one is in the back, and he was in. Oh, yeah? So he very opened the sliding door. Yeah. So I would come down and says, Eric, is that you? And he answered, uh-huh. <laughs> he was drunk. <laughs> That's a, that's a life lesson for everybody about the pebbles. It's quiet out here. You can hear a lot of stuff. So just be mindful of those type of things. Because uh, it, it is something that you might not think in the, the big picture it helps. But <laughs> with the pebbles, with the lights, with the locks, with the signage, with all that type of stuff, you added all of these layers to your house. It's, it's, a, it's a psychological effect. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about this, but not for too much. I didn't see a lot of issues with people getting their mail stolen. If that is incorrect, let me know. I didn't hear a lot of it. Yes? No? Maybe some? Uh, I didn't really hear a lot of it when I looked at the report. So, uh, big thing to know 
is reported to the postal service, the postal service, huh? The mailman says to myself, don't put up your red flag, because that's a sure sign that you have mail in there. But if you get the mail every day, leave the flag down, put your letters in there, and that's okay. I've been doing this for years, no, no problem. So if that's what the mail people told you, I'll leave that's their jurisdiction. Yeah. Uh, we, I don't get involved in mail. Yeah, because when you put up the red flag, I mean, they know there's a letter in there. Um, and depending what it is, because our mail is being picked up, delivered very late. Yeah. So my mail goes out at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock, because then the mail only comes about 5. Mm. So that's another deterrent. Mm. Yeah, so I'll leave that all up to you. We, we generally don't get involved with mail and those type of things. What I was going to say is, uh, call the post office if somebody steals your oh, mail. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Uh, but they're going to say, call us. So yes, that is true. So call them and call us. File a report with both people. But can you tell them why is it that they steal the, the mail? So they steal mm -hmm. mail uh, for identity theft, for checks, mm -hmm. and for credit cards. Yeah. That's generally the reason why they steal mail. That's the big things. Uh, rarely is someone going to steal your mail for your round table coupons. <laughs> rarely. <laughs> Unless they really love round table or round mics or whatever. They're not really going to steal your mail for that. So another cool thing the post office offers is this thing called informed delivery. If you haven't heard of it, here's an introduction. Basically what you do is you sign up, and what it'll do is uh, they will actually take a picture of all the mail that you're gonna get that day. So they would take the picture on Tuesday for your mail that's gonna be delivered on Wednesday, and that way on Wednesday you know what's coming. Wow. Even packages. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 No, explain that to me again, I'm sorry. I have, I have that in my phone. Oh, you do? So informed delivery, it allows you to see what mail you're going to get the next day. So uh, if it's packages, if it's, you, you know, you say, you know what, I'm expecting a check or I'm expecting uh, some type of uh, letter from the DMV, they'll, they'll let you know what's coming. Uh, and it's free. You don't have to pay for it. I, yeah, I don't have it on the papers, but it's called informed delivery. So, uh, holiday safety tips. The holidays already went by, but I have this slide up here because of these guys here, these locker boxes. So, uh, what ends up happening is you can get your package delivered to these boxes. If you use the internet, what will happen is it'll give you a pin on your phone. You walk up to the screen, pump in the pin, then the door opens. You get your package, close the door, you go home. You never have to worry about waiting for your package. You never have to worry about, am I going to be home? Is someone going to be home? Is my neighbor going to be there to pick up my package? You don't have to really worry about that Did anymore. Did you pay extra for them to deliver it? Uh, I can't say because I haven't heard anybody tell me. Uh, where I live, I live in Monterey <coughs> County. Uh, we're not as advanced as you guys. So we don't have these cool things. Uh, for, for a little more old school. Uh, so we don't get these cool things. But you guys have them. And I haven't heard anybody tell me that there's a fee. So if there is, uh, you know, I haven't heard. Uh, if you're more of like an old school person, uh, you can always get a P.O. box. You can get your stuff delivered there. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about, you know, cell phone, and pay and all that. There is a fee associated with it. But you know your things are always going to be at the post office. It's always going to be there. So uh, vacation tips. Uh, don't let your mail pile up. Put your trash cans away. If you're the person that parks a boat or an RV in front of your house and you only take it out when you go on vacation, <laughs> just know that someone's watching you. Yeah. I always have to talk about this. It doesn't matter if it's younger generations, older generations, middle generations. Don't <laughs> post your vacation until you come back home. Don't do it while you're in Monterey, don't do it while you're in San Francisco, don't do it while you're in Vegas. You can do that after. I'm eating at this restaurant. So yeah. Go to my house, it's empty. Basically, because you never know who's actually on your social media. You don't know who's following you, you don't know who's following the person that's following you. So just be mindful of those things. There's always ways that people can use social media to get information from you. So, uh -huh. uh, the neighbor across the street, uh, they were at Kai's store. <coughs> they broke into they broke into his car, 
mm-hmm. <coughs> garage opener, mm-hmm. and they are registration, mm-hmm. so they knew where to come. They opened the garage door with the garage mm-hmm. opener. So they broke into mm-hmm. it at Kaiser, they knew where the house was at, they came over here. Uh, oh, I don't leave now any papers in my car with my address. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I have my registration in my wallet. Yeah, that's a difficult thing. Yeah. It's a difficult thing. Uh, because, you know, you kind of want to prevent those things. So we're going to talk about it. I'm going to shuffle through this a little faster so we can get through it. So I already gave you all this. This is this paper here. We talked about it. How to identify your things. Use it. Make copies of it. There's an extra one here. So if someone wants it, they can take it or make copies of it. Uh, vehicle safety. Cars get broken into generally 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. At nighttime. Generally, that's when cars are going to get broken into. If you're at a mall, if you're at a big shopping center, it might get broken into during the day, but that's just because of the matter of the location. Residentially, generally it's going to be at nighttime. What do they take? Well, most people are going to say, well, they just take electronics. Generally, yes, that's true. They are generally going to take electronics, but if you have a bag, if you have a gym bag, if you have food, if you have things like that in the back seat, that's probably also going to get taken. So just be mindful of that. Um, I hope that you all don't do this, but my coworkers that work in downtown, uh, they've been told by residents there, well, I should be able to leave my sunroof open and my laptop in the back seat. Oh, no. I should be able to do that. Why are you telling me that I have to close my sunroof? Uh, I am letting you all know, please close the sunroofs. And if you have a laptop, don't keep it in the back seat. Because your laptop's probably going to get stolen. So please, don't do that. What we would hope is if you can make a car look like this. Now, is that possible? Probably not for most people. Most people have kids. Most people have family members. They have pets. Whatever it might be in the car. When you see this as a person... Are you more likely to break into this car, or are you more likely to break into one of these two cars? What do you all think? Yeah. This one or the other one? Yeah. And you all are not criminals. <laughs> None of you are criminals. Not yet. <laughs> that is a different story, sir. That is a different story. So, if you came to that conclusion, and you're not criminals, you can imagine what conclusion the criminals are coming to. Sure. Here, you took our package. <laughs> <laughs> I was told to. <laughs> oh, that is funny. You have a glove box, who knows what's inside a glove box? You have a trunk, who knows what's inside the trunk? Am I going to risk it and waste time on this when the car next to it has everything in plain sight? You're probably not going to waste your time on this, right? You're going to go to the next car. So, just be mindful of those type of things. Of course, not everybody can make the car look like this, but you can try. Yes, you can. Is it a good idea <laughs> to open the, the glove box so, so they know there's nothing there? No. <laughs> no? Uh, no. No, no, because then they're going to look inside your car. Um, and the last thing you want to do is tempt them to get close to your stuff. And yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so, uh, common sense layers of protection. Uh, park in a garage if possible. If you have a garage, park inside your garage. Park in well-lit areas, close all your windows, close your sunroofs. If you have a convertible, put your top up. Uh, unless you know that you're in a coastal location where there's nobody in sight and no one's going to jump into your car. Uh, remove the keys from the ignition. That's a self-given, especially now with a lot of cars having push buttons. Uh, remove all electronics. Please, remove all your electronics. Second layers of protection, now this is if you're a little uh, more on the handy side, uh, you can put uh, an alarm system, uh, you could put different locks on the wheels, wheel locks, wheel mechanisms. Uh, this thing here is the club, but for the brake and the steering wheel. If you put it just on the steering wheel, they're probably going to drive away with the car. <laughs> they can do it. If you put it on the brake and the steering wheel, now it's harder for them, because now they have to figure out how they're going to break it loose, and the pedal is probably going to be stuck. The other biggest way you can prevent your car from being stolen? Don't buy a car. No? <laughs> You're close. Drive a stick shift. 
<laughs> oh, come on. Serious. Drive a stick shift. A lot of these young kids do not know how to drive a stick shift. <laughs> Well, that's your choice, yes. If you put it to the brake, yeah, you don't turn the, the brake back so. Well, no, because they, so what happens is it has this back part. Oh, okay. And it goes to the back of the oh, firewall, okay. the brake, and then the steering wheel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, stick shift. A lot of these young kids don't know how to do a stick shift. So that's one of the easiest ways to prevent the car from being broken into. Are they selling, are they selling cars with stick shifts? Yeah. They still know. are. Oh, yeah? They're pretty rare. They're pretty rare. They're pretty rare. Uh, actually, yeah, they're, they're getting a little too rare. Uh, I actually saw that if you just have the club on the steering wheel, it actually takes them about 15 seconds to defeat it. Wow. Yeah, so it's true. They just yeah. cut through the steering wheel and just pull it right off. So. Oh, they yes. cut the steering wheel? They cut the steering wheel. Oh, okay. Yeah, so just be mindful of those type of things. Uh, this, I always put this up because we're still in winter time. Uh, don't preheat your vehicle if you don't have to. There's no snow here. Uh, if you're trying to warm up your car because you want it to be warm and toasty when you get in, uh, don't leave it alone. Or if you have a garage, do it inside your garage. Just don't leave your car running. Don't, don't try to do this. Like I said, we don't get snow. Uh, so generally, put some gloves on or something and get in the car. Uh, this is the list of the most stolen vehicles that we have for 2017. Uh, so this is 2017, not 18. 18 just ended, so we don't really have the data for that yet. So, uh, Honda Civics. 96 2000s, Honda Accord, 94 97, pickup trucks. And this is this guy here, and this guy here, throw, throw, they throw me off. Uh, a 2014 18 Corolla and an Altima, 2013 18. And generally, those cars, newer cars, aren't on the list because they're hard to steal. So I'm kind of wondering why those cars are on there, but they're on there. That's what's on the list. Uh, and this is where I got it from, the NCIB. So it's the National Institute of Car <coughs> Release. Uh, if you have one of these 90s Hondas, uh, I'm sure you all have known for a long time to be careful with those. Get stolen with the flathead screwdriver. So uh, to kind of finish this <coughs> before I give you all some time to talk, uh, Crime Stoppers, you can report crime anonymously. You can let, and you don't, you don't, we don't get your phone covered. <laughs> Because this is a different service. Okay. This isn't run by the police department. Basically, what you do is you call, or you can do it online. You leave a tip. If it leads to somebody's arrest for any kind of major crime, we actually give you a monetary reward. So we would take the money to a bank, and then from there you would go and collect the money from the bank. We would never meet you. We would never know who you are. Uh, this is one of the things that Matt was talking about before he left, so I'm going to talk about it again. So, uh, reporting illegal, illegal dumping, abandoned vehicles, any kind of thing like that, you can do it through a thing called My San Jose. It's an app. That information is on this top square here. Uh, so, you can download the app. It's free. You already paid your taxes. Uh, I apologize if you have a Windows phone. This does not work for Windows phones. It only works for Android and Apple products. So you can download it. Basically what happens with this thing is you take a picture. So you would grab your phone. You open up the app. It says My San Jose. And then it will give you new request, my request, whatever it might be. You go new request and then it gives you a menu. Of abandoned vehicles, potholes, graffiti, whatever it might be, or even if you say no, I want to contact a certain department, but I don't have a phone number, you can try looking it through here. Basically, what you do is then you pick on something. If it's an abandoned vehicle, you can take a picture of it from your phone, or you already have a previous picture. You put in the make, model, license plate, all that good stuff. You'll get an email notifying you that they received the information, and then from there. It takes maybe a couple of weeks or a week for them to go out there, tag it, then they have 72 hours to move the car. Yeah. Uh, if and it, it, yeah. And for graffiti, they do it within 24 hours. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Really fast. Yeah. Super fast. Yeah. Can you say? Can you tell the the group why it's important to report graffiti? So uh, graffiti, for those of you that don't know what it is, or you've heard the word but you don't kind of know what it is, graffiti. Is basically uh, illegal street art, or in the gang world, 
Uh, that's how gang members communicate to each other about whose turf it is and whose turf it isn't. Sometimes they'll also put up signs on the graffiti saying who they're going to kill or what crime they're going to commit to so-and-so, whatever it might be. Uh, you don't have to make a judgment call on any of that. We have a gang awareness presentation that goes for about an hour. So that whole graffiti talk takes a long time, so I'm going to give you the small sample of it. Uh, but basically, if you see graffiti, report it. Uh, because it could be gang activity, uh, it could be someone that's giving out a message of a crime, and we generally, like the gentleman said over here, we want to get it down as fast as possible. It's 24 hours usually as fast as they get it down. Sometimes it's even a few hours. Yeah, if they're in the fast. area, the contractors, in a few hours they'll cover it up, they'll try to make it look nice, cover it over. So that's why it's important to report it. Because mm -hmm. uh, here in your area, you don't really have a lot of gang problems. Um, but in kind of like the middle part of town, on the other parts of the east side, you do have gang issues. So, uh, last but not least, I always like to give this phone number here, conflict resolution. If you have a problem with your neighbor, uh, you don't have to punch them in the face. Uh, you can call this number here. <laughs> okay, David, okay. Yeah. You can call this number here. And basically what they do is they get you and your neighbor together, and they get someone who works for the county as a counselor and tries to hammer things out between you and your neighbor. So you have a civil conversation, and you try to talk like grown-ups. <laughs> Good luck. That number is also here on your list. It's on the city side. It says a conflict resolution 24-hour outline. So if you have an issue with the neighbor, and we as a police department can't fix it, because you say, you know what, their grass is overgrown, or they have a lot of trash on their front yard, we as a police department, we can't really do anything about it. You can maybe get code enforcement to do something about it. Uh, but even sometimes code enforcement, they might not be able to do anything about it. So, uh, just to have a conversation. Yeah. Are there neighborhoods that they get together to put cameras? Mm. Oh, I get what you're saying. So, you're not allowed to put cameras on city street lights. Mm -hmm. That's against the law. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what I have heard from neighbors uh, is they'll have a fund that they all get their money together. And they say, you know what, you live on the corner of, uh, what is this, uh, Beckley and Watkins. And you live, let's say, you live on the corner of <coughs> Old Field and Beckley, or whatever it might be, or almost whatever the street is. So they would collect the funds and then give them the cameras so that they can see what's coming in and out of the street. Okay. But they would have to place them on their private property. Yeah. You cannot place them on mm -hmm. the public street poles. Yeah. If you do, and we see them... We're going to take them. But that means that uh, the, the fees for the service of that particular camera company yes. is what we're paying for, or we would be paying for, for the monthly fees and for the equipment of the camera. Yeah, yeah. So it would be okay. you and your neighbors paying for that. Yeah, you and your neighbors. Um, there, there was a camera system that was going around that the city implemented. I'm sure maybe some of you heard of it. Uh, it was called the Blight Hotspot Cameras. Yeah. I don't know if anybody heard of that. You maybe. So they, they were putting cameras in the areas where they were having the most activity with the legal dumping. Mm -hmm. So they would have the camera there for 90 days, and then they'd move it to the next location to try to get license plates. Mm -hmm. But that moves around the whole city. Mm -hmm. So, But you don't have problems with the legal dumping, so you technically wouldn't be able to get those cameras. Okay. Can you give us a couple of minutes, just what's coming up the pipe as far as... Um, young people that are underage, that is, you know, you cannot phone them because they're minors. Yeah. Is there any legislation that is changing that status or uh, what can we do uh, civically act to be active on that particular item? Yeah, so uh, I'll be very brief with it uh, because we only got about five or ten minutes, uh, but there are some things that changed with the new laws and new new time frame. So, um, but we always tell everyone that uh, in community meetings and any kind of event is that we don't make the laws at the police department, we just enforce them. So you all as residents make these laws. So uh, there's a new law that went into effect uh, where if a person is 15 or younger, we at the police department can no longer talk to them at all. 
Unless a lawyer authorizes the conversation. You cannot talk to them? No, not at all. You cannot ask them why nope. they were not in school? Nope, nothing. They are 15 years younger. That is a law that was enacted uh, in the state of California. Uh, there's also a new law that came in um, where uh, whenever you pull someone over now or you, you contact someone, there needs to be a report that's written and filled out about why it is that you pulled that person over, what did you see that led you to pull that person over, what judgment calls were you making, what biases did you have or not have when you pulled that person over. So um, each report is taken between 15 minutes to 20 minutes at the most, 10 minutes if they're really fast. Um, so it's taken between 10 to 20. Uh, so every call or every stop, that's going to be time added on top of every <coughs> event. So uh, just letting you all know that it, that it is coming down the pipeline, that is something that, and that's a statewide thing. Um, there's also a couple other ones that went by, these have been around for a while, uh, a couple of the propositions were uh, drug possessions or, or, or drug, inf being under the influence of drugs, they went from felonies to misdemeanors, and people who were convicted for felonies can now appeal and get a misdemeanor, uh, that allows them to get out, things of that kind. Also, there was a, a change in non-violent crimes. So if you commit a crime, but it's not a violent crime, you can petition to lower your, your charge or get out earlier. So all these things are kind of happening at once. Um, so um, those are all things that are kind of occurring. Uh, thankfully, it sounds like you all aren't really having any of those kind of issues with that. Uh, we did have a problem last year with the armed carjackings. Um, and yet you were at the community meeting when we talked about that. Um, it seemed to come, come down. Uh, armed carjackings were on the rise, but now they're calming down. Um, so if you are worried about someone carjacking you or whatever it might be, just be vigilant. Uh, park in reverse. The reason for that is you can see who's coming in front of you, who's not coming in front of you. Uh, you always want to make sure that you have a good line of sight. And that you're always mindful of who's hanging out and who's not hanging out. Most of these people that were committing these armed carjackings were young men, generally. Uh, all shapes, colors, and sizes, it didn't matter what they looked like, they were young men. So just be mindful of those type of things. So when you say you can't talk to someone under 15, you can't talk to them unless you have probable cause that they're committing a crime or you... Well, so if, if you ask me for a sticker, I can talk to you. Yeah. But let's say that you went to Evergreen High School. Mm -hmm and they caught you with a small amount of cocaine. Mm -hmm. I cannot talk to you until your lawyer has a conversation with you and informs you of your rights. So you just arrest them. Can you arrest them? So this is where it gets kind of tricky. So I'm not arrest them. So you can take them to juvenile hall. You can process them through the juvenile system. Uh, but generally what's going to happen is because it's a non-violent crime uh, and it's a small possession of narcotics, generally they'll probably be out or they won't even go to juvenile hall. Will there be a record of that? Uh, yes, but it won't technically create a criminal, I guess a criminal history for them. So a lot of these laws were also implemented because uh, a lot of people feel that uh, certain demographics are being taken advantage of or being forced through the juvenile system so they're trying to correct it um, but of course that also makes everyone's job a little difficult um, and some people feel like oh now we can't do anything about it I mean people can still do things like you said uh, you can always uh, get together as residents and you can change these laws if you don't feel that they benefit you that is up to you though and uh, Matt was here from the district gate office he's another person that you all can contact uh, to talk about these type of things. Yeah. My wife has a question about. Oh, I have these two for many years. Uh, do they go back? Yes, they do. They do? Yeah. I never use it. Yeah, yeah. So they go bad, and then another thing too with these things is uh, the pepper sprays, you have to be mindful of how far the person is from you. Uh, because what ends up happening is it shoots out with a lot of pressure, and it'll actually go back on you. Oh. So, so, so this might not work? Probably not. If you had it for a while and you haven't primed it or used it, probably not. Okay. 
And what about the taser? What is that? Is that a pepper spray or is that a taser? Oh yeah, no, uh, no. Taser? <laughs> 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 I'm kind of worried for your safety, sir. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, Uh, I I am not an expert on tasers. I cannot say, uh, but um, you generally want to look at the instructions. Be careful with those things; uh, they're pretty dangerous. So uh, I notice you step back. What yes, yes. <laughs> you appreciate the detail. Uh, so uh, one of the big things that we always like to do before we always end every presentation is uh, we like to give you all time to talk amongst yourselves, and share phone numbers with each other. So you all can communicate. Um, I don't know if you all have a next door group. I don't know if someone, someone said I have a Yahoo group. I don't know how you all communicate, uh, how you all know each other. Uh, but this would be the perfect time to elect someone or get someone to kind of get everyone's information together so you all can talk to each other. Because uh, what's the point?